And now we come to a dense topic. Reads, decisions, guessing, what informs your choices? Reads are, of course, twofold between general feelings that you get for the opponent's rhythm and more direct observations that you consciously make. And contrary to might of what you've been led to believe, strong players are not, in fact, performing AP calculus equations in their minds whilst they're playing. If there's a logic to a specific read, it's not going to be that complex. It can't be. If they, if it is a complex read, it's not going to be made in the moment of play. It's going to be something that was calculated beforehand that they just reacted to, or it's going to come uh, across as a general feeling or an instinct that they've just conditioned their brains to look for over many, many matches. See, people condition their own play to be better suited for reading opponents. They don't actually put that much mental energy into calculating every given guessing situation. For example, I want you to think of, say, like, a uh, fucking Breath of the Wild. Now, people love to look at open-world games like Breath of the Wild and say things like, oh, my gameplay is different from everyone else who plays because it's, like, totally open. I get to make my own unique experience that no one else did. But this is very juvenile and generally false. It's indulging in a make-believe fantasy that people are all extremely different, and that by giving players choice, they will diversify themselves from each other. That's not true. Statistically speaking, I could tell you the exact locations that the vast majority of new players in Breath of the Wild went to, and in usually what order. I can tell you which shrine they're most likely to do after leaving the tutorial plateau, because human nature is human nature. Most people generally have instincts or conscious thoughts that are nearly identical to a million other people in the world. Game designers know that, say, if they shine a big light source on something, it's much more likely to get most players to notice it and consider it an objective or something important. Just naturally. It's not guaranteed, but most players tend to make the same instinctive decisions and pick up on the same things. This is generally how reads work. Think of most reads as you would think of good game design taking advantage of human nature. Directing players through exploiting their instincts rather than telling them explicitly what to do, you know? Obviously, you'll never be able to completely predict another person, and players in games can do whatever they want, but the statistics don't lie. Almost everyone did the same goddamn shrines in Breath of the Wild in very similar orders. People really aren't that different from each other when it comes to what they happen to end up picking. And even if a player is going to do something different from the major trends, they're still probably using a thought process that a bunch of other people are doing, just arriving at a, a different conclusion. They still fit within a category of people that hold an extremely similar, rational series of instincts. You know, the fact of the matter is, if you watch high-level players effortlessly seem to read everything their opponent does, reading movements and button timings and anything that can be considered a read, which is most of the game, you probably aren't watching someone who could break down and show you and tell you 100% exactly why they did the things they did in every situation where they guessed correctly. Most of the time, they play, the way they play has just been naturally adjusted to match up with the human tendencies, the more subtle human tendencies that are inherent to most decision making. They've played enough people and they have a general feeling feeling of how people like to make decisions, even if they can't explain the actual extremely complex logic of those decisions because that's completely unrealistic to do so. Now, the problem with this fact is that there's no real shortcut to having a better instinctive grasp on human tendencies. All you can really do is painstakingly study replays of different people and how they make decisions on a micro level, mentally categorize different types of people that you play against based on their personalities, and just keep playing. When I say mentally categorizing them, I don't mean make hasty assumptions based on a small amount of data. I mean, once you have all the data for someone, try to categorize their personality traits based on how they make decisions. Sometimes their personality eh, will be split up into multiple different categories, like they might have a different personality on defensive choices than they do on offensive choices. Are they active? Do they always want to be in control? Are they being proactive? Do they panic in certain situations? How do they seem to think about risk versus reward? Does their risk reward change at all if they're losing? Uh, do they seem to get easily frustrated if they're almost dead or if you're almost dead? Does the match get dragged out a lot? How much respect do they give you in general? There are some more simplistic human tendencies that can be more easily explained, such as, like, take footsies, for example. Say the opponent isn't pressing anything, and you want to approach. You enter into their poke range, they still aren't hitting buttons, so you decide to take advantage of that nothingness, 
of the fact that they're not doing anything and dash up for a throw. But all of a sudden, you dash, and suddenly they press a button. You think, why did that happen? There were no there were no buttons before then. There, there, there were no buttons for like like 10 seconds straight. Well, it could be possible that something about your movement tipped off the opponent, and it's important to take the same lens you'd take to an opponent's movement and button timings to reviewing your own replays after the fact uh, to see if you're accidentally telegraphing something. That's... To, to see if you're accidentally telegraphing something, you can't really make those kinds of judgments during a match, so watching your play and replays is very important. But it's also possible that it follows a very basic principle. The closer you are to the opponent, the more likely a button will come out. The longer nothing happens poor, the more likely the opponent wants to do something to break the monotony. These two factors combined create a situation where if no pokes get pressed for 10 seconds straight while you're approaching, the chance of them poking at that point will be drastically higher than any point in those previous 10 seconds. See, generally, if you stay around the opponent's uh, the range of the opponent's longest pokes and then you start seriously moving forwards, that's generally a good time to stick out a button to counter hit whatever reactive move, whatever poke they put out, or back off and try to whiff punish or block or otherwise uh, put out a button to, uh, to buffer uh, the whatever poke they put out, or just doing something like jumping. Uh, to go over whatever poke they end up doing, if your jump will make it over and punish it. People generally are either looking to react to something specific and hitting buttons that fit into their expectations, so you can either counter what they're trying to do based on their plan, or make them suddenly realize they need to react to something they weren't expecting by doing something out of the baseline. You can make them suddenly see something unexpected and doubt their plan without thinking it through, and their reaction to a poke or doing something outside their game plan will be exploitable. This is one of the most consistent ways to predict someone's actions, because it's a choice they make unintentionally. The only way for them to avoid this accidental reaction is for them to have, is for either for them to have predicted your action, or for them to commit entirely to not reacting to things that surprise them, which will allow you to get longer walks-ups into throws, and you can abuse their passivity. Instead of closing up closing the gap and then dashing, I'd recommend dashing at the opponent from well outside of the range of a dash-up throw. If you dash from a decent range away, remember, footsies is not the range of your normals, it's a range of a dash-up plus your normals. If you dash up to the range in which you can poke with, like, your longest or best good normals, then you're suddenly uh, in a place where you can condition them, you can stuff them if they try to put out a button. And, uh, yeah, like, take this situation, for example, I talked about before. So, yeah, like I talked about in the footsies um, thing, uh, you know, it's better to dash from out here, not just because uh, you can, da like, one of the main reasons why you want to dash from out here where you can just barely get into the range of your dominant options is not so you can maintain the position where your, your moves are still dominant, because if I'm here and I dash forwards, I'm not in a dominant position. Sakura is dominant in that range with her moves, whereas uh, my moves beat her moves at this range, but... The other thing is that the closer you are to the opponent, the more wary the opponent is of you trying to approach. Whereas if you're playing it here, out here, there's uh, way more things that you could be doing. And so if you can um, take a dash up into that range where your moves just barely start reaching or anything like that, it's going to be more successful. If you dash from a distance that doesn't feel threatening to the opponent, you can quickly get from a neutral space to a space where the opponent now has to be worried about getting counter hit by your buttons. If you watch a lot of uh, high-level soccer players play, there's uh, tons of actions, tons of offense. I would say most of the offense starts. Because remember, we talked about uh, her, her um, frame traps and actual pressure is not necessarily the best, but she will constantly like get into ranges just from dashing it. Like, like she can be so far away and dash up and still be at a range to harass the opponent. So the opponent has to feel threatened all the time. Like, that'll catch them low and go for a knockdown. So they have to be worried about that happening all of a sudden. In addition to, she can be zoning from back here. All sorts of things she can do by utilizing the dash into her longer pokes. This is generally a better strategy for dashing at opponents than trying to be very close before dashing the last bit of distance. You should consider dashing to be an extension of your footsie tools rather than a way to get in until you're confident in the range and, and, uh, and, and when the opponent will be stationary and docile. Another simple human tendency, panicking after a bad sequence. Especially early on, the most likely time to bait out an EXDP is after you've just landed two combos in a row. If you get a good sequence going, the opponent feels like they have to stop it. This is true on hit and on block. It's the easiest DP you'll ever bait, very telegraphed. 
Another trick is the human instinct to hate doing the same thing over and over again. If you play rock, paper, scissors, people don't like to make the same choice three or four times in a row. Now, this is of course, like any situation, this is technically still a guess. Never gonna cover all players, but some will take advantage of the fact that you won't expect the same thing, say, five times in a row. But in general, there's a very natural human tendency to assume a pattern after, like, two or three things of something. For example, get a throw in the corner on an opponent that generally seems to respect your offense that isn't, like, super buttonsy on, on their wake-up. Walk up, throw them again in the corner. Now you've done two walk-up throws in a row. It's very common for the person to quickly think of this as a pattern and hastily think of the solution. Hitting a button to stop your walk-up. For the third choice, after your two walk-up throws, you just do a meaty button, you'll often get a counter hit and get rewarded for it. Another incredibly useful technique in neutral is the ability to lull your opponent to sleep. Rather, instead of choosing your furthest tools all the time, be more turtly in your style, creep a bit closer to your opponent and use slightly shorter range tools. If I'm Falk, and I play a large portion of the match just using the range of my crouching medium punch, I can keep using crouching medium punch to make sure the opponent is playing about that range, because that's where they consider the footsies to be played. And then suddenly, I whip out my longer range move with forward heavy punch, bop them right in the face. They get so visually used to the range of footsies being played at crouching medium punch, they walk straight into it when I use my longer tool. Players will get complacent if they are lulled into doing so. They will get used to walking in and out of the range of moves you frequently use, so use shorter range footsies tools and then get them to walk face first into your longer ones. Since their mind is training to see the range of your slightly shorter moves. If you block a cross up jump in in the corner, look for the opponent to try to jump back out and then air to air them if they do. Now, in all honesty, when the opponent jumps at you in the corner, it is like a rough situation to be in. Because, um, you know, they are putting themselves in the corner, but one of the advantages is that they basically get in almost for free, since it's kind of hard to anti -hire. A lot of characters have trouble anti-airing that jump-in angle, so it's a good way for them to get right in a position for a mix-up, and if you guess wrong, they can put you right back in the corner a lot of the time, so... Let's have record that one as well. Back tick throw, and then, um... like that so if he jumps in and then throw text me so if I block his jump in by throw tech or delay tech or whatever if I time it wrong if I do it too late or something I'm gonna get beaten by that so that can be rough to deal with which is why when you block a uh, this jump and cross up in the corner a lot of like players will go for like an immediate try to back dash uh, uh, now, uh, V-Shift is a pretty common action in this situation. But yeah, anyways, like, beyond the fact that this is just still a rough guessing situation, what should you be looking for immediately? Well, let's turn on all these things. We'll try to check the throws. As soon as he does the crouching medium punch, so, crouch, light punch, crouch, medium punch. I'm more or less pretty safe to backdash, because if he finishes his frame trap, tech, tech, backdash, I get away from it. There's not a lot of things he can do without hard calling out the backdash. So, backdash is fairly safe to do there, and I can, um, I can anti-air if he happens to jump after that. But yeah, I'm just staring at the sky. Like, at this point, I'm just, like, absentmindedly kind of doing delay techs, you know, and uh, just looking at his corner escape options. And then when he does it, I punish him for it. That's what my focus is on. These situations are common gimmicks with high reward, low level players will do frequently. So train yourself to look for these tendencies first in these situations. In terms of emotion, desperation is what you can most frequently measure. And desperation will affect how likely it is that the opponent will double down on a tactic or change up their tactics. Either one. They usually won't stay exactly the same. Either way, they'll play a bit differently. Now, an opponent might be desperate even if they aren't losing that badly. You shouldn't base it strictly off the numbers, because any situation that might frustrate or annoy the opponent can cause desperation, even if they are still technically winning. Try to observe when the opponent seems to be making desperate, not calculated choices to try to beat something that you're doing. Maybe your defense is just really solid and it's annoying them. Maybe you keep escaping the corner. If they're put into that situation again, they might get desperate and do something aggressive or risky. 
Now, unconscious biases and human tendencies aside, let's talk about risk-reward. Like it or not, guessing is always going to be guessing. At the end of the day, you can't actually know everything that someone is thinking. You will be wrong, you'll make false assumptions, a guess is a guess. This is especially going to be true if your sense of natural human tendencies isn't as developed as stronger players yet. But you're fighting an opponent who doesn't make decisions that seem to be logical either. Like I said, you can either read an opponent through your conscious thought, or through your play and taking advantage of natural human tendencies and how you've just generally developed to um, that seems to work well. If you can't really do either of those things, then it's better to make your choices more on risk-reward while trying, at least trying to avoid playing in such a way that makes yourself predictable to your opponent. As a rule of thumb, I'd recommend playing safely and in a way that will generate a lot of data. You should think about what your strengths are. Like any player, you should think about what your strengths are as a player. You know, you might not have as much experience, you might have great execution, maybe you don't have all these toolkits or anything like that, all this experience and matchup knowledge or anything, but what can you have as a player that you can more easily acquire that other players might have? You can work on your patience, you can work on your anything, like any of these things are skills that you can have that will drastically exceed your opponent if you commit to them and will give you a leg up for utilizing a lot of these strategies. Try things out that are relatively low risk that will allow you to study the opponent. Use a variety of tools to see how the opponent responds to these different situations, and also for the added benefit of making the opponent have to think about more things, so that they have a harder time anticipating what comes next or keeping everything they need to look for in their own mental stack. I don't think I really need to explain the risk-reward as a concept. Like, you should be able to look at the pros and cons of, say, going for a meaty throw, or the risk of the situation if they throw tech, the post-throw tech position, which I should mention is something you should extensively lab against a variety of characters to see what your good options are, so that after your throw is teched, you don't feel like it's a huge detriment to you. And yeah, look at the value of punishing V-Shift if that comes out, the value of not giving them something to block and V-Reversal if their stun is high, or, or if V-Reversal would let them escape the corner, that kind of thing. The value of applying actual offense versus the risk of getting EXDP'd for your trouble. See what's a good option to go for with the highest degree of frequency. In general, I'd say die slow and kill fast. That's, in my opinion, uh, early on, that's the best way to get a lot of data on the enemy and also play to your strengths and roll the dice of guessing in your favor. Don't throw tech too much on defense in situations where you could pay dearly for it. You know, take a fair amount of throws, but mix it up. Maybe V-reversal a lot, depending on how you break down your value proposition for your V-gauge in particular matchups. Just die slowly. You know, when, you, when you're on defense, be very patient and look for the more aggressive forward movement or plays so that you can uh, uh, plan ahead of time. If you're going to die, do it in a way that will definitely be slower. And uh, even if you're eventually going to die, don't, like, try to reverse the situation immediately, necessarily. And uh, um, uh, force the opponent to show more of their hand in order for them to kill you. That will get you a lot of data. When you get the chance to apply your own offense, go for it. Don't just do a safe block string every single time. Go for the kill. Try things out. See if they stop you. Try to move up on them. Especially if the reward for them working out is is uh, uh, is big. If, if the reward for your attacks being successful. Try for dash up sometimes. Do stagger pressure. Try to catch counter hits from their pokes. You, need, you first need to force the opponent to take action for them to survive. If the opponent doesn't need to act to survive, then you can't condition them to do anything. Then you can't predict them. That means going for a lot of meaty and a lot of walk-up throws to force them to start teching, force them to start taking action or poking, and then try to exploit those actions. The name of the game is conditioning, and it's also helpful to your ability to see the bigger picture and maintain a healthy mental state. Don't try to win each situation. Instead, look at each spot you're in on offense or defense and think, like, don't think about, oh, what will the opponent do here, and then try to counter that. Don't do that shit, man. Don't focus a lot on trying to counter and expect particular things all the time from your opponent. Instead, just create your own reads and expectations. Don't throw necessarily because you think it'll work. Throw because you want to condition the opponent to expect throws. Be scared of letting you be on offense all day. Consider, like... Things you're placing in the opponent's mind, expectations and patterns that you're intentionally doing as a resource that you can exchange for perhaps some variable amount of meter and or health from the opponent. When you make choices, 
Do so to set up mix-ups and expectations to exploit. If you eat a few EXTPs here and there because of it, so be it. Better. Better to eat those three and still win a round and then get a, 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 a get a big punish in the next round than it is to keep giving up your offense and try to bait things out that you haven't forced from your opponent. But in general, it's way easier to make the right read in a guessing game that you have created rather than trying to win a guessing game made by your enemy. Don't expect things or anticipate things. Force them to happen through conditioning. You can do this on defense as well. Don't, like, sometimes you can tech, not because you really think they're going for the throw, but because you just want to vary your options. Sometimes commit to just staying blocking a lot of the time, not because you think they won't throw in that particular instance, but because you need to condition them to not be super confident in their offense all the time. People have wildly different game plans for what they want to do, but most people tend to react with similar conclusions and choices when they put them in the same situation. When you have a solid read on the opponent in a conscious sense, Sometimes, there is value in waiting to capitalize on it for a good sequence. If you, say, do a meaty throw every time, and you could do a shimmy at any moment since they're so conditioned to expect the throw, sometimes it's a good idea to use that as a resource to wait until the condition is even more prominent. And then when you get a solid hit and a solid sequence going, that's when you really capitalize on the read and shimmy them uh, bait out their throw tech for a big reward when you have all your resources, you have the corner, you're almost going to stun them. Like I said, conditioning is another resource. You can choose when to spend it to get the most value out of it next to all your other resources. Another important lesson is the idea of erratic players and controlling chaos. See, when you're fighting an enemy that you just don't understand at all, and this will happen, you, you can't read them, they make no sense, you know, then one of the most important things is to keep in mind is limiting the options of someone who makes wild choices. You can keep up your risk-reward, you know, take your offense most of the time, do, uh, if they DP a lot, do, like, some delay techs and delay jabs, but also accept that you're just gonna eat some DPs and, and keep taking your turns and your throws and such. Play in such a way that they have fewer options available to them. Simplify their chaos. Any situation where you can force them into a certain position Cage them as much as possible. Keep frame traps tight. Don't be very fluid with your delays or your gaps or your movement. Go for frame tight mix-ups or very, very small gaps, very, very small walk-up like um, stagger pressure. Really iron out the nuance and keep the situations basic enough to force the chaotic player to have to, absolutely have to pick between a small number of options. A mistake a lot of people make early on is thinking that an erratic player that, like, if they just give an erratic player space, that they will hang themselves. Not true a lot of the times. In fact, if an opponent makes a lot of mistakes, then you should let those mistakes happen and then punish them. But being erratic and wild is and aggressive is not the same thing as an opponent making mistakes. Like I said earlier, if someone chooses between a hundred different options all the time, it can be hard to have your mental stack wide enough to react to all those things you might have to react to or read and predict ahead of time punish. You know, don't let a crazy player run you over. You want to control them, limit them, don't panic on them, put them in finite and clearly defined situations, and by extension, don't try to play too much in very murky, undefined situations. Don't try to predict something that you won't realistically be able to predict. Remember, the most important thing is not losing sight of your own game plan. You don't want to play, if the opponent's entire playstyle is erratic, you don't want to play into their game plan and into their weird nonsense. If you let an erratic or confusing player shake you, you'll lose because you're playing significantly worse than you usually do. Because you won't be reading and playing like normal, you'll be playing awkwardly, stiffly, You'll be tr you your entire game plan will collapse as you try to play in a way to counter their uh, craziness. You won't be smooth, you won't be alert. If you stay relaxed and play like you do against people you're more comfortable with, you'll win through uh, the, the superior game plan that you have and the mathematical reality of risk-reward and your inherent reads and adaptations that you can employ while still keeping to your game plan. Whenever you find yourself hyper-fixating on something simple or silly or bizarre, you need to mentally step back and play looser with less tunnel vision on that thing that is throwing you off. If you need to, just take some time. Back off from the opponent, relax yourself, take a better look at the whole match, see if there's another way, and think back to your game plan, then get back in there. Now the reality is, you need to go for stuff that works. That's how you win, you know? 
if you feel like you're playing sharply and well, but you're just not damaging the opponent enough, it's probably because you aren't aggressive enough and forcing them to guess to your rhythm. If you need to go for the aggressive strategy, go for it. Go for the dash-up throw, even if it feels like... Not scrubby, but for lack of a better word, like if if you're not going for things that might work and like will force the opponent to take action because you either feel anxious or because you have some sort of like um, disgust with that action, like you feel like it's not clean to do that, that is only holding you back. Go for this or that offensive play. You need to make plays because it's much better than letting your opponent initiate all the plays in a match. Unless you're so confident that they're risky enough to kill themselves against your defense, or you just want to keep uh, and use a life lead, obviously, and exploit that. You know, you might feel some anxiety about taking an offensive risk, especially if it feels gimmicky, but you need to learn to just go for it. Like I said, my motto is die slow, kill fast. Make defensive choices that will let you live longer and get more info from your opponent. Don't, uh, you know... Don't worry about winning the current situation, just think of it in a long term. Adapt to what they seem to abuse quickly, and when you have the chance, put the opponent in a lot of situations where they have to guess and act on your actions. Get information from that. If you die slow and kill fast while paying attention to the data more than trying to succeed at the current action, you're sure to improve your reads over how players tend to respond in different situations. You are sure to improve your reads. You know how Geef's Jim says that Oh, because the opponent might throw a fireball is not a good enough reason to jump. Well, the same is true for anything else. The opponent might do some crazy YOLO shit, but that is not a good reason to not, you know, say move forward when you can. Let's take this example. Alright, so this is a situation that will happen a lot, and this is a, a, a something that can really, um, like, make certain players, uh, like, shut down their game plan entirely. So say you have a, a, a G or whatever doing this. So he's doing all of his movements. He's like walking backwards. Oh, suddenly, oh, low smash. Regular EX, low smash. If I inch forwards, might, maybe I'll block it, maybe I'll get hit by it. Like, look, if I, I keep crouch blocking, it just deter, it just depends kind of on, like, maybe, like, I'm kind of giving him a tell because every time I, every time I crouch, it means that I'm not too long uh, uh, away from, like, walking forwards again. So that tells him every time I, I move that uh, to the, the crouching position, if I was playing a real opponent and not just like a random um, chaining dummy. But that would give him some information. But other than that, I'm just leaving it up to like the percent chance, which means that I would have to spend over half my time sitting still doing nothing in order to play if I were trying to use this to like bait out and stop his action. Those numbers are not very good. Even if like his action, statistically speaking, is really bad in terms of risk reward. Like, uh, his reward is not necessarily the greatest for doing it, and if it's blocked, it can be uh, easily and heavily punished. One, it depends on um, how strong your offense is once you actually get the knockdown. If your offense is pretty weak, it might not even be that bad for him. If your punishes suck on it, it might not even be that bad for him. So he's totally willing to keep doing this, and it can be rough to deal with. So just living it up to inching your way forwards and never taking any action, not only does that make you incredibly predictable, because in order to play in that style where you spend over half your time just crouch blocking in fear of, of the random low smash, it, it, it just it leaves you sitting still for so long, which makes it easy for him to do literally anything else to play against you. But it's also just a waste of time, and it's still not even that statistically likely to be in your favor. So that is bad risk-reward logic, you know, to, to play against this like that. Instead, if we play outside the range of it, he has no reason to do it, because he can't get rewarded for it. We have more freedom of movement. If we're within his range, maybe we might want to um, up back, because even if he does it around the same moment that we up back, like that, it won't, it'll catch us if we hold backwards to walk, but it won't catch us if we up back. So if we're like in, a, in this range or something, we can up back to get out of range. We can easily whiff punish it if it comes out. So, we take, we get out of the range, and then we can easily, if he keeps doing it, which most players won't do, we can easily punish. If he stops doing it, we can take advantage of that. So, any time where he's not doing it anymore, when we're outside of the range of it, and he has no reason to go for it, at any point, 
we can suddenly commit to entering into that range. So if we're like out here, we can suddenly do like bam. And now I'm in a range where I'm actually threatening him with like a jump in, a lot of options. Do you think he's going to suddenly react to it if, you, if we've been playing sort of, and, and your movement is much loose at, at full screen since you're not at a threat of getting hit by the, the EX low if you're out of range of it. So if you're playing really loosely with your movement and unpredictably with your actions over here, and then you suddenly move forwards, is he going to, is he going to in, input low smash in this time? Is he going to do something about that? Probably not. You know, there's a certain, like, pretty broad window where you suddenly enter the range in which an opponent has, like, broad actions they can take. A character with bison with slower walk speed and faster dash movement, um, it would probably look something like that. But yeah, and this will also, if he is continuing to try to zone with the, the EX smash, this will give you a greater ability to take advantage of that. When you move forwards, you should do it in one lump sum. That'll, that'll, that'll let you move forwards more, and that'll be more likely to bait him out into trying to take action against it. That'll be more likely to make him try to stop your forward movement rather than just like inching little bits and bits. That's a terrible game plan. So when you commit to walking forwards, you can't see the move anyway, so you might as well commit to walking forwards for as long as you can that he won't be able to react to you, see? Might as well. And there you go. Then the risk reward will start to be in your favor again. Don't let DPs stop you from taking offense over and over. Don't let erratic movement stop you from going for things you know should work. Don't let these th things stop your game plan. Just adjust the frequency a little bit and keep taking the action to net yourself more information. Don't stop hitting buttons in neutral because a player will randomly DP sometimes after whiffing st stuff. Instead, play normally, but then sometimes make specific reads for when to bait these things. You'll have an easier time predicting stuff if you keep f falling into their patterns and 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 um letting them keep get away with it so that you can look for one scenario to really make it hurt for them once you call it out if you need to just practice and adopt some risk of aver averting techniques like if someone does dps and minus situations a lot really adopt the delay buttons or creating some space if someone jumps a lot use more lights and more movement in your neutral rather than bigger longer buttons when you move around especially when you move forwards you're in a delicate situation you can play delicately and only walk a tiny bit forwards or backwards to minimize the percent chance that you'll run into like a long button or get clipped with a big long low by some characters. But in many situations where you are where you aren't worried about an uh, an action happening at basically any moment, you can take what I call effective range. Like I showed and talked about with G throwing out low smash from full screen, if you're outside the range of his low smash, he has no reason to throw it out. It's way more risky to him to just do it when it doesn't won't reach. Once you're in his range, any movement that you do, forwards or backwards, carries some risk of getting hit if he happens to low smash at that moment. However, if he's in a situation where he has no reason and isn't going to throw it out at any moment, once you're outside of his range, you can probably do, like, maybe two forward dashes before he reacts to the changing situation and realizes you're closing the gap and can input the DP motion for the low smash. You should have an idea of the amount of time it takes for someone to realize something they weren't looking for and measure how far forwards you can move in that time. You know, like, just because there's a possibility that someone might do something at any given time, that isn't an ex- like, like, maybe you should, like, take a risk-reward percentage and just, like, make it so that 70% of the time you're crouch-blocking and then the other 30% of the time you're moving. But don't just, like, inch forwards once you're in his range and do these little, like, micro-walks. Proudly, chew, like, commit and decide that you're going to walk forwards or dash forwards using a decent amount of time. Using the amount of time in which you can move forwards before he even realizes that you're consistently moving forwards for that time. Then use that movement to scare him, get into his range and threaten him. All right, so here's 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 the example that I most. This is the one. This is the match that I thought it would happen in. Yeah, I, I distinctly remembered this part of this recent match. So, uh, Tokido. I mean, they talked about this all the time. The number of times he successfully hits um, people with the EX tackle for just walking forward. So this is a very similar situation. So he's in a situation where EX tackle will most certainly kill him. One hit away, and that's all that's going on. He's he's trying to move forwards, wary. That's this is the entire situation. 
But look at actual look at Yamaguchi's actual movements. Now, obviously, he does lose this match, but like he's an extremely strong player, and the point is that he, that he's not playing in a necessarily tentative way. When he chooses to move up, he chooses to actually take his movement. You know, the amount of time that he can move before Tokido can react to the situation and choose to do something differently. And even if he chose to do something differently, he doesn't want to get baited out into doing something by Yamaguchi. So Yamaguchi isn't very like like overly tentative he, he he takes his space you know look at look at his walk-ups you know very tentative uh, uh backwards movement backwards movement so the majority of that was statistically um most of it was majority of him blocking but then when he does take movements look at that walk up now he does get hit but yeah just managing the statistics and um taking his actual advantages when he can despite the risk that it carries instead of um putting the risk reward not in his favor by being way, way, way more tentative. Whenever you have a read that an opponent isn't currently in a wild state where they feel they, where they might feel pressured to do something, when they're just kind of in a docile state waiting for the next big thing to happen in neutral, take advantage of that wholeheartedly. So in these situations, move forwards a lot in one big migration. Don't inch your way forwards, little, uh, little, little, little stops, little stop and goes, you know, if it, if it, it, it's going to give away. Because doing that is going to give away to your opponent that you're trying to approach. When your opponent might not even realize you're really trying to, like, close the distance. A lot of the time, if you're applying pressure, especially if you're conditioned to the opponent to expect frame traps or walk backwards movement or after, after you dash in, making them block some button or something, if they're in the mindset that they really don't think you're going to move forwards in this situation, this is a case where you can tend to land a lot of throws. If you suddenly move forwards, even a pretty long distance where the opponent has plenty of time to see you coming, they still often won't be ready for the throw tech, because they'll most likely only register in their minds, ah, they're coming towards me, and then they'll probably try to poke with like a light button or something, rather than go for the throw tech input. So he does standing medium punch, now it's extremely common and most people in this exact situation on both sides have been conditioned that when Sakura does like a standing medium punch on block, usually it's into like a crouching medium kick or some kind of frame trap, or if there's a walk up, it's going to be a minor walk up into another standing medium punch. So watch this entire sequence play out in real time. Huge walk up into a forward throw, no buttons, no even delay buttons because it, the situation is so good. See, altered there, like after the situation was presented, but on the first time, it's just not a situation in which his defensive mentality and, and um, was, was, was on that possibility, because it just doesn't happen very much. If you're closer, and you're clearly trying to apply pressure, they'll be more on guard and ready to throw tech or something, but if you catch them sleeping in some far-off frame trap, you might be able to get away with a big walk-up. Because they're not on guard at that point. Moving on to unpredictability. I've talked a little bit about this with how hard, uh, how it's hard to beat opponents that simply rotate between like a checklist of options that seemingly work at random, that they just choose any random thing you can't predict. But you can utilize unpredictability yourself in a lot of ways. In addition to playing around with the looseness provided to you by the, the nuances of your own game plan, you can be unpredictable on defense, offense, and in neutral. Like I said, you don't need to worry about getting every situation correct, making the right read here and there. You need to work with patterns. Long term, you can keep your defense unpredictable by smoothly rotating your options in a mostly safe way without paying too close attention to what your opponent had been doing. And this will help make you tougher to crack. Another aspect of unpredictability is using moves that are visually confusing. I've talked about this a little bit before, but like take Sagat's light kick, for instance. This button does not have a lot of pushback on block, but Sagat's animation during the attack has him leaning backwards really far. This makes it hard for player for a lot of players to tell how close he is visually. There are many instances where high-level Sagat players will land a throw by walking forwards in a throw range, doing light kick, and then tick throwing off of it, because the opponent visually saw and lo it looked like Sagat was a lot further away than he actually was. They didn't even try to tick because they didn't see that he was still in throw range. A good way to read someone is, in a situation where the spacing is a bit off, but you know what the opponent wants to do, you whiff punish them for it. 
There will always be awkward situations in matches. Some some clusterfuck situation will happen. Say an opponent has, like, a go-to block string off of this button or something, but, like, if you can see it, or maybe uh, by design you moved in such a way where they're actually slightly further away than they normally are, you can tell the opponent is going to go for this block string. You know what they'll whiff and when. It's a much easier clean whiff punish. There are a lot of moves and movement options and such that will let you take up a visually unclear position and uh, trick your opponent into messing up spatial recognition. You know, space traps. This is a strong aspect of unpredictability and it leads to a lot of whiff punishes. This is why players have certain autopilot space trap buffers. Because they do a move at uh, an unusual range, maybe it's visually confusing, and it creates more distance than the opponent even expected, and they naturally try to take their turn. So this is a classic situation of this happening. Block this. Oh, it's minus six. Stick out like a minus a six frame or something around that line. This auto buffer specifically timed. Two crouching medium kick. Okay. Well, those don't interact like that. Auto whiff punish. Do heavy kick. It was too slow. Do a jab. So, auto space trap. Stuff like that happens all the time. The mentality for this is extremely similar to frame, frame traps, since you have a set sequence of buttons where the gap is specifically designed to be timed to whiff punish the button that they poke out in response. But it's usually more effective and lands more frequently than true frame traps because players know that they should respect frame traps. They're much more cautious around frame traps. But when a player sees something negative at range, they feel like they can, should take their turn, should take action, and they're more likely to bite on a space trap. This is some advice that Seth Killian used to give out, but sometimes, every now and then, you should do something that just flat out doesn't make sense to a normal player, to the expected meta. Look at a weird option you can do, and then if it isn't that bad, if, if you're wrong for doing it, just go for it to throw the opponent off their game. Throw in the occasional filth, like uh, the occasional disrespectful, disrespectful play. If your opponent, no if you normally play very respectfully, throw in the occasional trolly action or bizarre sequence. It doesn't even need to be something that will net you a reward. If you can make an opponent unconfident in their read on you as a player, it will generally just help you. When you feel like you just, in a match, you just keep guessing wrong over and over. You choose different options and they all just end up wrong. Just go back to your fundamental fact of life game plan mix-ups. If there is truly some way that the opponent is predicting you perfectly and you don't know why, don't worry about it. You won't be able to study yourself in detail or figure out why an opponent might know everything you do ahead of time, if it's even possible. So don't even bother thinking about that as an option in a real match. Just stick to the facts. If a situation is a 50-50, there's a 50% chance you'll be right. Stick to the numbers. Run the numbers. Being wrong a bunch of times will not change the reality of the statistics. So if you keep seeming to guess wrong, ignore it. Keep going for it. Uh, if you can't reason out why you're being wrong. So that's about it for this one. See ya.